and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm going to go okay. ahead and mute everyone. Um, so if you have something to say, uh, you can use um, uh, you can use the chat box. Okay. So welcome. I'm Susan Meyer Shirk. I'm a professor of history and director of general education at MTSU. I want to thank Sheila Otto and the LTNITC for inviting me to present this workshop entitled Teaching and Zooming, or How I Learned to Love Zoom During the Pandemic. Um, there's a disclaimer here. I have not only been, or I have only been using Zoom for about eight weeks. I'm not an expert or a Zoom trainer. I learned some things along the way that I thought might be helpful, and I would like to share them with you today. I hope that those of you, you who have experience with Zoom will offer comments and questions, and I hope that we can support one another as we think about how to deliver remote classes effectively. So first a word about procedure. Um, this is a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar. This is the environment you will use when you teach. Uh, today, you're getting the student perspective. Typically in webinars, the audience is silent and participates by commenting in a chat window and asking questions in the Q&A pop-up window. We have a big crowd today, and it might have made sense to do this as a webinar, but I wanted you to have the student experience. Today's format opens with a 30-minute presentation that includes lots of images of Zoom from the host perspective. Please feel free to comment and ask questions in the chat window while I'm presenting. Uh, FYI, Dr. Katie Brackett will be monit monitoring the chat window during the PowerPoint slide presentation to make sure I don't make or I don't miss any questions. So you should feel free to be uh, commenting in the chat window. She'll flag me if there's something um, that I need to address. When screen share is enabled, as it is right now, you can access chat by hovering your mouse along the top of the monitor and clicking the chat button to open the chat pop-up window. You'll need to click, click the word more to find the link to the chat window. Uh, we'll, all, we'll follow up this presentation with breakout groups so you can brainstorm with your colleagues about using Zoom. And we'll close the meeting with a 10 minute wrap up to pull this all together. I'd like to do two quick polls to get a sense of your comfort level with Zoom. So I'm going to go ahead and start a poll here. And the first question I will have for you is about uh, the Zoom experience, your Zoom experience, how much you have. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. You should be able to see on your screen a poll that asks you which terms describe your skill with the technical aspects of Zoom and choose one answer. And I'll just let that run for a couple of seconds, 15 seconds or so more. Anyone else want to have about 88% of you have voted? I'm going to go ahead and end the poll so you can take a look at um, who's here. So um, we have, although these were anonymous, um, we have most of you place yourself in the beginner and inter intermediate range. We have a couple of experts here. I'll be looking to you for help as we go along. Um, and then a couple of us who uh, have no clue, and that is okay. Uh, we will figure this out. Um, all right, I'm gonna launch now another poll um, about your interests. Um, and this is, you may choose more than one. You should choose all that apply. Um, Given what you know right now, what aspects of Zoom do you think might work best in helping you achieve your teaching learning objectives? Choose all that apply. All right, another 
five seconds or so. And then I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. And share out the results. I am going to be talking today specifically about breakout rooms, Zoom office appointments, and recorded sessions. I know lots of you are interested in screen sharing. You'll get to practice that uh, during the breakout sessions. Um, but I think I need another, um, I might need a whole other webinar to really go into screen sharing uh, in more detail. Okay. Hey, well, that's Susan, help, helpful really to me. Good. Yes. Um, we've got a good question. Um, Dr. Martin wants to know if polls have to be planned ahead or if they can be done on the fly. That uh, the answer is you can do either. Um, there's a way to, uh, to do them ahead of time, which I did for this, and then you can also create them on the fly. And again, that's, uh, there's, there, we would probably need a whole other session to kind of go into the details of polling, which I'm glad to do and I'm glad to talk at the end uh, about polling if people want to learn more about that. Um, okay, so today I want to make the case that Zoom can be a good tool to foster student connection and engagement and a good tool for providing access to content and community during the pandemic. But I also intend today's session to foster conversation among faculty about the usefulness of Zoom or not and to allow you to be intentional in its use. You may decide it is not the right tool for the task and that is okay. What this session will not do is give you a detailed explanation of how, of how to Zoom. It is not interactive in the sense that you get to host a meeting and practice Zooming. Rather, it is interactive in the sense that you will have the opportunity to interact with colleagues, to build connections and networks of mutual support among faculty. Okay, I just realized actually, I'm having a technical difficulty. I just realized there's a part I, I missed and I wanna go back a slide and um, make one other comment. I got sidetracked on chat. Um, I wanted to make sure <laughs> that, that you knew my cardinal rule of Zoom. Um, and that is don't worry, don't stress or apologize when things go wrong as they will. Uh, the technology will fail you. You'll forget how to do stuff. Babies, cats and dogs will wander on and off the screen. That's okay. Uh, we are in difficult times and it's okay to give ourselves and each other a wide margin of error. I thought of that when I was uh, kind of trying to figure out where, where I was in this whole process. All right, so let's skip back to the purpose of today's session. Zoom is a tool for connection, engagement, and accessibility. Um, it is not uh, a technical session. Um, it will, uh, it, it's really meant, like I said, to focus on questions of pedagogy. Okay, benefits of Zoom. I wanna begin by briefly introducing what I see as some of the benefits of Zoom. I should say I am not an advocate of technology for technology's sake. Instead, I want us to be thinking in terms of how technology allows us to achieve our teaching and learning objectives. I saw three main benefits this semester in our wild scramble from on ground to online that I think are worth highlighting. First, Zoom can contribute to greater engagement and connection for students. Second, Zoom allows you to record the session for students who cannot attend in real time. Recordings are automatically transcripted by Zoom and that contributes to accessibility on several levels. And finally, Zoom is relatively easy to use for both faculty and students. There are disadvantages to Zoom. Zoom will not make your lectures magically more interesting, and in fact, it might have the opposite effect. Lecturing on Zoom, whether live or pre-recorded, is its own art form, distinct from on-the-ground lecturing, and probably needs to be another workshop. Second, internet access is not always stable, either for you or your students. And finally, Zoom raises issues of access and equity, even as it potentially makes classroom materials more accessible. Students may not have the hardware they need. They may be embarrassed to share video of their living space. Perhaps they are sharing that space or the technology with someone else. That maybe they can't use Zoom in real time because their spouse or their partner or their children or their roommate need the technology. Um, so I wanna be clear, I'm not claiming Zoom as a panacea for pandemic learning. 
That said, Zoom can be enormously useful, and I'm going to talk about the what, three ways I use Zoom this semester that were relatively easy to do, that were helpful in increasing engagement, connection, and accessibility, and that can help you get the maximum benefit from Zoom. So one of the things I did was set up a virtual office so that students can easily meet with me. Um, I used Zoom to record or pre-record sessions so that students could view the course materials as they were able. And I used breakout rooms so students could talk to each other and work in small groups. Set up a virtual office, the first of three easy ways to make the most of Zoom. How do you create a Zoom office that is easily accessible but also secure? Easy access is critical to me because, frankly, I use Zoom to talk with my 80-something-year-old parents. I need something without a lot of road roadblocks, and that's true for students, too. But I also need something secure because I don't want to get Zoom bombed with my parents. So how do I do this? Um, well, the first thing you have to do is log into your Zoom account online. And if you haven't activated your account, there's a link here um, where you can go do that after this session and get your account activated. And in that account, you create a personal meeting room with a stable ID, and then you enable waiting room, the, the waiting room option, and you disable screen sharing. Although I said this workshop was not a how-to, we'll briefly look at what your account looks like when you go online. Once you've created your MTSU Zoom account using your FSA credentials, you can log into your account and click on the personal meeting room tab circled here in red. The first time you click this tab, you'll be given a series of prompts to set up your personal meeting room, including a prompt that's, um, that lets you name the room. Go ahead and do that, and don't worry about what name you, you choose. You can change the name later under the profile tab. Mine's already set up. You'll see that I named it Myers Shirk Zoom Office. You'll notice that I have a meeting ID associated with it. Um, but I chose not to require a password, and instead I enabled the waiting room for my Zoom office. When visitors click on the link I sent them, it takes them to the waiting room. I admit them to the meeting when I'm ready. This is how we did the meeting today, too. Um, this is handy because I can schedule appointments with students. They can arrive at any time and wait for me in the waiting room. It also keeps out unwanted Zoom bombers. If I see a name I don't know, I don't let the person into the room. By clicking on the Edit This Meeting button, I can change the settings for my personal meeting room. And at the very bottom of the of the page, I can add polls. This goes to the question earlier. Um, this is one place where I can add polls. These polls are always available in my personal meeting room, and I can use them or create new ones on the fly. The other option I recommend for security purposes is to, just, is to disable screen sharing except for the host of the meeting. Zoom has now set this as the default option in response to some high profile incidents. They have also beefed up their security settings in general. To set or check the screen sharing options, you go to the settings tab in your account, in the left hand column of your Zoom account, and from the settings page, you can customize the settings for meetings, for recordings, and for your telephone access. I recommend thoroughly familiarizing yourself with the settings page because it allows you to use Zoom more effectively. You can decide all the kinds of things that you want to do. Uh, you set, you put them, you enter them in the settings and then that allows you to do them in the rooms when you open them. In, to disable screen sharing, scroll down through the settings for meetings until you find screen sharing and click host only. That way, if hackers do break into your meeting and you have not disabled screen sharing, they can hijack your screen and share whatever objectionable material they want. Enabling the waiting room and disabling screen sharing are two strategies that keep your room accessible and secure. Some features can be edited in real time during a session. If you click on the security button, which is only on the host screen, you'll see that you can enable screen sharing and waiting room from within the meeting. You can also lock the meeting. If um, once everyone's in, you can say, I don't want anyone else in, just hit lock. 
So let's return to the question of pedagogy and how to use a Zoom office. First, I recommend that you schedule appointments rather than offering drop-in office hours. I know lots of folks have done this, but if you have drop-in Zoom office hours, most students will not attend for the same reason that they will not attend on-ground drop-in office hours. Many of them are petrified at the thought of unstructured time with their professor. That awkward silence at the beginning of Zoom meetings is magnified a thousand times in a Zoom one-on-one -on -one meeting between a student and a professor. That's why it's so important to use your Zoom office for structured meetings with a specific goal, such as advising students on program changes or reviewing drafts of paper or papers or research plans. Finally, you want to activate the file function in the chat window so that you can share documents with each other. Um, if, you, if you've graded a draft of a paper or a lab assignment, you can return it in real time during your virtual meeting. By the way, I've done that for this meeting and I uploaded a copy of, or I will upload a copy of the handout you'll need later in the, uh, in the, in the meeting, in the workshop, and you'll be able to download it from the chat window. So to do that, to activate the file transfer function, for your, meeting, for your uh, Zoom rooms, uh, go back to your settings page, scroll through the meeting set settings and find the file transfer button. Make sure the button beside it is blue. Now, when you launch a, a meeting that you are hosting and open the chat window, you'll see a button in the bottom right-hand corner that allows you to upload files. That's what it looks like. All right, any quick questions about, um, specifically about offices and about Zoom offices? You wanna go ahead and write those in the chat window and um, Katie will uh, field those for me. Um, you may wanna designate, oh, I wanna give you a quick tip. If you're teaching large classes, managing your presentation or discussion requires your full attention. And so you may wanna designate a student uh, or GTA uh, to monitor the chat window and draw your attention to questions. All right, any questions? All right. Um, I see, how do you keep grades secure during a discussion of many people? Um, if you, um, and this is from Mary Martin. If you, uh, there is a function where you can share papers. Like if you, uh, when, I, when I was talking about the Zoom office, I was talking about sharing um, a paper with a student you're meeting with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but you can actually return papers essentially in a Zoom session because there is a function where you can um, uh, privately send someone um, a, uh, someone can, you can privately send someone a message and in that you can upload a document. Um, yes, Mary, Mary says that sounds dangerous and I agree. I would not do it actually because I would be afraid that I was sending it to the wrong person and that you could end up um, sending it out to, um, to the whole class when you meant to give it to one person. I agree, I, I, I probably wouldn't use that function. And in fact, I, um, I have the private, um, uh, you, I think I turned it off for this meeting is that you can't chat privately uh, with other uh, um, uh, people in the um, in this session. Um, okay, Mary, this will be my last question and then I want to keep moving so I don't fall too far behind. Um, do you pick the topics for your meetings? When I'm meeting with a student, um, I, if they want to meet with me, obviously they have something they want to talk about, of course, yes, come see me. Um, but Typically, if I'm going to schedule a meeting with them, it's to talk about a paper or it's to talk about some uh, specific issue. Okay. So the next uh, or the second easy way to make the most of Zoom is to record. Uh, let's talk first very briefly about how to record and how to access your recordings after you have saved them. Then I'll talk about the pedagogical value of recording as well as some of the pitfalls. It's easy to start a recording. From the host navigation bar, click on the record button. I recommend that you choose recording to the cloud to save space on your hard drive. To access your recordings, you go to your Zoom account, 
you click on recordings in the left hand navigation bar make sure the recording you want to view falls within the dates that you've selected click on the session you wish to view and you'll see that you have multiple options you can download this file if you want it on your computer you can copy a shareable link um, that you can put into D2L so students can access the video and you can view the material in three formats. Um, there are two settings on this page that I, um, that I can use to control who has access to my videos. And I, uh, I wanna look at those. The first is sharing and the section, second is reg registration settings. Sorry. Okay, this pop-up appears when you click on the share button. If you share a link with your students, you need, a good, again, a good combination of security and accessibility. This semester, because I was on a steep learning curve, I didn't mess with authenticated users or password. I was afraid students would be blocked from access. Instead, I allowed the recording to remain public, but I made it available on demand with registration, and then I disabled downloading. So you see um, here the blue button means that it's on demand viewing and then I, the gray button means that they cannot download this video. When I set this video, video to view on demand, this button for registration settings then appears um, and allows you to adjust your registration settings to your preference. When you click on the registration settings button, this is the pop-up window that, ap that appears. If you click manually approve, you will have to approve every request to, to view the video. Clicking manually approve allows you to track whether and when students are accessing the videos, although it does create another layer of work for you. This semester, I allowed automatic approval, partly because it took me a while to figure this out, um, and um, it just depends on how tightly you want to control and monitor access to your videos. Um, if you close that pop-up window and click view registrants, uh, to see, you can see a list of students who have accessed the video using the link that you provided. And here's what that looks like. You can see name, email, date, and time of access. And I, I include this because I know there are some, some folks do have concerns about being recorded and about sharing those recordings out. We've looked at how to record and how to share, and now I want to look at why to record and share, which is really what this um, session is about. There are two ways to approach recording in a situation where teaching and learning are largely or completely remote. First, you can record class sessions as they happen, live lectures, gameplay, book discussions, etc. what we're doing today. Uh, in my reacting to the past games, and these are deep, historical deep role-playing games, I recorded game sessions for students who couldn't be in class because of work or illness and they wanted to know what was going on. You can also pre-record lectures or voiceover PowerPoint slides. Once you have your Zoom office set up, you can enter the office, share your screen, uh, record the lecture in Zoom and share it with your students in D2L. Both have some benefits. Both approaches mitigate some of the problems associated with synchronous teaching. Students who can't attend a session because of work, illness, or technology problems can view the content at their leisure. Both have some of the same problems. Watching long videos of other people talking can be tedious, and students won't necessarily take advantage of something that you may have spent a lot of time and effort developing. Likewise, watching the video of a live session without interacting can be pretty tedious. Um, both recordings need to be closed captioned or in some other way made accessible. Here's a screenshot of a lecture I recorded in my Zoom office and shared with my students. You'll see the Zoom generated audio transcript on the right. I did not use PowerPoint live captioning for this recording. Instead, I used presenter view in PowerPoint. And so students could read my lecture notes while I lectured. The Zoom audio transcript is solid, but not exceptional and needs additional editing, which I have not done. Um, so there are some oddities in it. So here's a, a quick review of best practices. Um, and I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't say what I'm doing right now is a best practice, <laughs> but it's a list of do's and don'ts. Um, do use a microphone and earphones to improve quality. Um, do record Zoom class sessions for students who can't attend in real time. Do use captioning uh, for live sessions. Um, do keep recordings short and do take steps to protect access to your recordings. Some things you want to avoid. Don't record 85 minute voiceover PowerPoints to replace your in-person lectures. Deadly. Likewise, don't record 85 minutes of a talking head. Equally deadly. Um, don't ignore accessibility issues like captioning or transcripting. And don't expect students to listen to the lectures without providing a tool or assignment to guide their listening and viewing. One of my colleagues gave her lectures live on Zoom this spring, and she devised strategies for engaging students in responding to the lecture as she presented it. And then what she did is she um, uh, required students who missed the live lecture to write a reflection paper um, based on listening to uh, the lecture, and she gave attendance credit for it. All right. So that was a kind of buzzing through that. I'm, I'm trying to get us to the breakout sessions because I want you to have a chance to uh, talk to uh, your peers, your colleagues. Um, let's see. Any questions? We do have some. Um, OK. One is, what is the benefit of using Zoom recorded lectures versus Panopto? So I am not familiar with Panopto. I wonder if there's anyone. I, I know there are a bunch of folks here from um, FITC and LT and ITC, is there someone out there who can um, unmute themselves and answer that question? Because I cannot. Carlos Coronel, Jones College of Business. Thanks, Carlos. I can provide some context to the question. Uh, Zoom is a video conference solution. Uh, there are several things that Zoom does really well. Panopt is a video management system that is integrated with D2L. So, some of the things that you won't have, for example, if you put it in Zoom, is there is no search capability. So you cannot do a search within the video for anything that appears in the screen. You cannot do a search within the video for a PowerPoint slide, or even for a word or words, key terms that the faculty said during the presentation. All that is searchable. Uh, you cannot generate stats of users. You cannot see who, which students watch, which videos, when, wow, how long, and stuff like that. So. There is a lot of other features that Panopto app add that Zoom doesn't do. And Zoom does very good video conferences. Even in the okay. recording sessions, uh, when, once Panopto is integrated in, M in MTSU, uh, the Zoom sessions, whatever Zoom recording session that you record to the cloud will be automatically uploaded to your personal folder in Panopto. So you can add searching capabilities. You can add discussions in the, in the site, et cetera. Yeah, this is different, but they're complementary. Right. right. I think that's a good point, that they're complementary. Um, that, um, that Zoom does some things as far as video conferencing that Panopto can't, but um, uh, Panopto has this more robust uh, editing and um, uh, search feature. Uh, and, I, and like you said, I think it's uh, integrated into D2L, so that's useful. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at the last piece of this um, that I have to talk about today, and that's the, the last of the three ways to make the best use of Zoom. And I would argue that that's um, breakout rooms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video that's actually made by Zoom that gives a nice, succinct summary of the basic elements of breakout rooms. And then we can go straight to a discussion of the pedagogical uses of Zoom, which is the, or of breakout rooms, which is uh, what interests me. So uh, let me play this. Hey, everyone. Farah from Zoom here. On this brief video, we're going to show you how you can leverage our breakout room feature to take a large meeting or cl virtual classroom and split it up into smaller groups or sessions. You'll see that I have already enabled the breakout room feature, which you can find in your settings along the bottom. And that breakout room button will actually be right here. Um, this is a button that only your hosts or co-hosts will be able to see. And um, right now we don't have a co-host in the session. If I manage my participants, 
I can hover over Catherine, for example, to make her a co-host. So she'll see this button now as well. When we're ready to split the group into smaller sessions, I can easily click this button to get a pop-up window asking me how many rooms I'd like to assign out and how many participants per room. Uh, for this example, it's recommending since there are six people, we can split it up into two rooms. I can do this automatically or manually. So if we click on the automatic button, it'll create, it'll generate those breakout rooms for us. Certainly if there's anyone I wanna swap out, maybe I wanna move Michael to the other room, I can exchange him for a different participant. Once I'm ready to open all rooms, I'll click this open all rooms button and our participants will be able to join the sessions that we've created for them. So we'll slowly see those people join. One thing that's really important to note is that as a host or a co-host, you can actually hop between the different rooms to talk to the participants. You can see here, I have the join button. Now everybody's left to go to the rooms. I can broadcast a message to everybody and say, uh, wrapping up in one minute. And this will broadcast the message. And then I can close the rooms, which gives them a one minute timer to rejoin our session. We'll give everybody a second to rejoin and I'll show you one or two additional features with breakout rooms. There we go, we can kind of see everybody kind of popping back in. Now everybody's rejoined the main session. You'll see that I have the opportunity to reopen these rooms again, which is really great if you have a very long session or a very long virtual class, you can split into these uh, virtual smaller groups as often as you'd like. And the additional options here will allow you to automatically close breakout rooms after a specified amount of time. You can also change the countdown timer to be 30 seconds or two minutes if you like. I'll show you a setting where you can also pre-assign folks to be in your breakout room before the classroom starts. You'll want to navigate over to the class that's already been created in your Zoom portal. Under the meetings tab, you can find your meeting. Scrolling all the way to the bottom, you'll see uh, if we open this to re-edit it, I have the opportunity to pre-assign a breakout room here and I can create the rooms and upload a CSV with all of my participants in advance so that their names are already populated in the room when I start the session. That's basically how you can run breakout rooms. We hope you found this video helpful. If you have any additional questions, please visit us at support.zoom.us. Thanks so much for watching. Take care. Uh, let me make a quick note about something mentioned in passing in the film. Uh, once the rooms are open, you as a host can join any of the breakout meetings and breakout room participants can invite you to join them. Uh, once you're in a breakout session, you can broadcast a message to all of the other breakout rooms from whichever room you're in. In this case, I had joined breakout room number two. And then from there, I broadcast out to all the rest of the rooms five more minutes. Uh, you'll have a chance to see this from the student perspective when we do breakouts in just a few minutes. Um, I'm a little bit behind. So let me quick get to why use breakout rooms. Um, uh, I would argue that they build community, that they engage student interest, and that they mirror the in-person uh, environment, and, and that this is a benefit. And I want to look at some examples of that. Um, first, uh, they are, bre breakout rooms are ideal for traditional small group work. For instance, one of my colleagues assigned a historical term to each breakout room, had them collaborate on a definition, and then come back to the main room to present the results. She um, also required them to watch one of four documentary films, and then students were assigned to breakout groups to discuss the movie. They watched, and then they wrote uh, a group review, came back to the main room to present their reviews. Um, second, breakout uh, groups allow time for private conversation among students. I play reacting to the past games, which are, as I said, are historical deep role playing games. And most of those games require a certain amount of scheming and plotting, either one on one with or with their factions. Um, or the games require students to give speeches and they can do that in breakout groups or, or in the main room. Third, breakout rooms are handy if you require peer to peer consulting. One of my colleagues allows class time in her on-ground class for students to share and edit each other's papers. Uh, breakout rooms allow you to reproduce that classroom environment and students can share files and their screens in breakout groups. Uh, 
And finally, breakout groups are ideal for project and problem solving teams. Again, students can share screens and files, which makes collaborating a little easier. A um, couple of quick tips. Um, you do want to provide guidance for breakouts um, and make sure that the assignments are meaningful and relevant. Um, but don't worry if students waste time. In some cases, and I have waste in quotes, um, in some cases, this is their only opportunity to see each other. And so they need to catch up. And that helps to build that uh, classroom community. Um, visit your breakout rooms. Uh, either at the invitation of your students or randomly. This is just like when you're in a classroom and you have small groups going and you kind of circulate to make sure that things are running smoothly. And then collect student work from breakout rooms. This links, the making of, um, this links to making the assignments meaningful and relevant. Um, it's easy for them to take notes in the chat window and then save that chat, or they can use the whiteboard and save the whiteboard, and then they can just put it in D2L or email it to you. All right, instead of q and I want to go, I'm going to send you straight uh, to breakout rooms um, and we'll pick up questions after you've had a chance to experience a breakout session and talk with your colleagues. So here's what we're going to do. Um, the instructions for breakout rooms are on your screen. I'm going to randomly break, create break, breakout rooms with about five people per room. Um, and I said there, Instructions are on the slide, but I'm also at this point going to upload to chat um, a copy of, let me go to everyone in the meeting, and I'm going to upload um, instructions. You should be able to see those now in the chat. Um, and I'm asking you ad to identify a recording secretary and who will type down some of your notes in answer to these three questions. Um, and let me go ahead and find breakout rooms. And we're gonna do, I think we're gonna try 15 rooms. This will give you five or six people per room. And everyone's registered, so um, all right, we're going to try that. Um, I'm going to open the um, the room. You should see uh, an invitation to join um, the breakout room. Uh, we're losing some folks, so. Um, and um, and I'd like you to spend a little time. Uh, so I have a question here. Can we see how you are doing this on your screen? Um, yes, I, when we come back, I can pull up some slides that will show you that. Um, okay, um, and I'm gonna go open all the rooms and let you um, uh, chat for, I'll set, uh, let's do 15 minutes and then come back and I'll be communicating with you uh, via broadcast so you'll and you can invite me if you would like me to come to your room. Um, there's a fair amount of you so that might be tough, but I will try. So I'm going to go ahead and open all the rooms. Hey, Susan. Um, we had a question about how to invite the host to um, to join your breakout room. You're you're muted. Let me. I can unmute there, you. <laughs> there, I got it. There's a there's a button in your breakout room um, that lets you do that. I visited two rooms. Um, I don't have a screenshot of that though to share. Um, let me go ahead and close all the breakout rooms and bring everybody back. And because um, this is, are we in the main room right now? Yes. Okay. Let me close them and uh, get everyone back here because we're over time at this point.
All right, and then I need to get back to my uh, to my screen share. What are you all seeing right now? Are you seeing my screen? Okay, good. You're seeing the PowerPoint. No, no. We're just seeing everybody in gallery view. Oh, all right. Wonder why that is. Um, Hello, Susan. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I know. Who was that that said that? <laughs> it was me, Joan. Technology, technology at work for you right there. I'm going to have to step out of the meeting. I have another meeting in 10 minutes right now. Okay. okay. Well, uh, Susan. Thank you. Uh, one thing to remind, I was trying to tell them uh, the reporting in Zoom. I don't know if you're going to cover that. It, uh, uh, cover what? I'm sorry. Reports, generate reports about the meetings, who attended. Oh, the right. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't, <laughs> I was only supposed to do an hour today, so <laughs> okay. I probably won't do that, but I may have yeah. to do another session. Uh, so. I just want to mention to everybody that if you want to generate reports of who attended Zoom, you have to use the registration feature for the Zoom meeting. Otherwise, it won't tell you. Right. Yeah. You yeah. have to use the registration. And right. Which, I, which yeah. we did today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, here. Susan. I hope you do thank another you. one. This was very helpful. All right. Hello, I Heather. I saw you down there in the corner. Hey, thank you. <laughs> let, let me. I'm here. Let, Thanks, yeah. Let me do uh, one thing. I, somehow I've gotten two screens going here. And so I want to go back to my PowerPoint. And, and uh, all right. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because um, one of the things I want to do, uh, and it is time to be. Uh, finished. Um, I'm losing folks here. Let me just real quickly tell you, I'm going to skip the wrap up. And I want to tell you about a faculty support network that we're trying to build. Um, I want to, uh, the, it's the vice provost office, it's um, Gen Ed, it's FITSE, it's LT and ITC, it's MTSU distance learning. And what we're doing is we're building a, a network to help faculty uh, prep for the potential, you know, what if, you know, what if we have to do some remote or hybrid or something. And so we're going to create faculty work groups and we're going to try and create networks of li liaisons, people you can go to if you need help. And then we're going to create a centralized web page for remote learning resources. Um, and if you're interested in being involved on that, in that in any level, go ahead and email me at gened at mtsu.edu or at, um, at my uh, email address, susan.myers-shirk at mtsu.edu, and I will get you um, uh, lined up to, you know, let me know what you want to do. You want to be in a faculty work group? Because I really think that one of the easiest ways to learn um, to learn how to do this stuff is to get in a, in, in a room with a bunch of other people and try stuff <laughs> and have, you know, have someone go into a breakout room and say, oh, well, what can you see? Or how do I find this? And, um, and then, uh, and so what we're, got, we're trying to do is kind of try to formalize that. So if you are interested, just let me know and we'll start building this network and um, uh, get as many people involved as we can to give you the support you need um looking at the fall and forward because given the times we live in um we just don't know what's going to happen um in the next uh, couple of months um okay so now let's go back to um q and a um see if we had one good question about um breakout rooms um are they recorded and then uh, are they going to be part of the script that will be uh, uh, made into a file after the meeting is over? So that's the tricky part on recording is recording only occurs um, in this uh, um, main room. Um, the, it does, you have to locally record. Each person has to locally record. And the one group that I was in said that they tried to record and could not. And that may be because of my settings. So um, the one thing to remember about Zoom, every time there's something you think you should be able to do and you can't, um, go look at your settings. Uh, because nine times out of 10, um, it, it's something, it's a setting that needs to be adjusted. Um, and then, 
Oh, and what was the other question? So recording. Oh, the chat. So what's really weird is I thought that the chats uh, room, that each of the breakout rooms had their own chat section and that they were separate from what was happening in the main room. But the group that I was in, the chat from the main room was there, right? Um, so um, I need to figure that out too. I honestly don't know. Uh, I, thought, I thought they were two separate entities because the recording was separate. I thought the chat was separate also. So that's a, that's a question for me going forward. I'll try to figure that out and uh, let you know what I found out. But what we are going to do is we're going to make the recording of this session available to you. It will not be the chat. It will not include the breakout rooms. I'm sorry. Um, we'll make a, a transcript of the chat available to you. Um, and then if you, those of you who did take notes on what your group talked about, if you could send those to me um, uh, by email, uh, gen ed or to my gen ed address or to um, my uh, uh, MTSU email address. Um, we'll try to compile those and see if there might be tips and questions and whatnot that might be useful to everybody. Is that helpful? Hey, Susan? Yes. Um, it's Virginia. I, I just have a, a quick thing to, to say. Um, in, in the breakout room, Carlos, uh, Jeannie asked Carlos about the recording thing for breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. And Carlos said that recording in breakout rooms is allowed if the host sets it right. so that participants can record yes. in the breakout room. Right. So we did ask about that. So he okay. said, yes, you, the host, would have to put the setting to allow participants right. in that you know, breakout room to, to set it to record. So yeah, yeah. it has no, to be I, manually assigned or something to me. Right. And nine times out of 10, the answer is, how, do you have the settings right? And so if there's something you find you can't do in Zoom, uh, just go back and check the settings and that, um, uh, and you'll pretty often find out that you can solve it that way. So. Something, um, I don't know. I know a lot of people know the control F uh, function for when you're on a web page or a PDF. I've, a few other tutors and I found that very useful when looking in settings because there's like a, a hundred or so settings right. in Zoom. But if right. you pull up the page and you just control F, it'll work to find whatever keyword you're looking for. So if you search breakout, it's going to show you the three or so settings nice. uh, immediately. That's a great tip. This is why I want faculty talking to each other because there's so much, there's such so much knowledge out there, pooled knowledge. If we're talking to each other, we can kind of help each other. Uh, I think that's the best support there is. In our group, uh, Jean Wilson had a, uh, a great idea. I think, Jean, you were saying that uh, the College of Business is going to talk about uh, Zoom etiquette. Oh, great. Well, I mentioned that we have a professional development program and that's one of the things we're talking about in the fall because I'm sure that many of you that use Zoom uh, this last semester, you probably saw that there were lots of things that we wouldn't want happening in our classrooms. So, right. <laughs> you know, right. new, new things to add to the syllabus now. Right. Although I stand by my, um, I tell my students, you know, if the dog, the cat, the kid shows up, no worries. I mean, that's just, um, that's the world we're living in right now. And so Absolutely. Um, I don't. It's the driving down the road or people in the bed behind you or grooming. Those kind of things. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't want to see that. <laughs> right. Well, yes, but, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. I, it's funny because I submitted a proposal to MT Engage on that very topic about, you know, don't do this like you know the sorts of things that you guys are talking about because I had a student who wore her pajamas um, and may I say they were very skimpy so and I felt very uncomfortable uh, in just watching her and I'm thinking oh how do I say this without saying this you know the other, the other piece of this, though, is that I, I do also support um, faculty or students who say they don't want to share their um, video. Um, and the reason for that is, and that this is an equity issue. Some of them, like I said at the beginning, are in a situation where sharing their, their picture, 
their video um, is an issue because they are maybe they're in a situation where um, the whole family's in one room and they can't um, uh, they can't zoom in private. Uh, I had a student this semester who um, when he signed he attended all the sessions but he did so without video and audio and he used the chat box to communicate. His mother was working behind him in the same room and she was dealing with um, talking on the phone with people about sensitive information and um, he didn't want that broadcast over um, the zoom session and yes definitely. Other, uh, I don't want to keep you any longer. We've gone a bit over time. I really appreciate um, uh, everyone's uh, attendance and participation. And, um, and I'm here if you have questions. I'm glad to take up these conversations. Um, we, may, we may be talking about doing another session where we can take a deep dive into things like polling and screen sharing and, and those kinds of things. Again, from the perspective of pedagogy. Anything else? No, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you, you all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, are we going to get the PowerPoint uh, that you shared? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can make that available too. Thank How, you. That would really help. Yes. How will it be available, just out of curiosity, by email or? Um, I hadn't thought that far. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can. I'd be happy yeah. to email it, Susan, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank yep. you. We'll send it out by email. All okay. right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay. Susan. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan.